if we live in a life only focused on immediate gratification, it gets very, very, very difficult to, um, uh, to be patient. We talked about this two or three classes ago, to be patient through the good deeds that we have to do, right? Um, sorry for the people who said there's no sound. I don't know why there's always no sound. I fixed it now, inshallah. Apologies for that. Um, so the origin of renunciation, first, as we just discussed, the origin of desiring to do this is you. we get the light, right? And then the Prophet told us that if, um, before we get to the origin, just one more hadith, that if someone renounces the world, they will feel relief in their heart and their body. And if they pursue the world constantly and constantly desire this, they will have an increase in worry, sorrow, and anxiety, right? So... Um, we have to examine ourselves when we're constantly feeling worry and sorrow and anxiety and stress. Why is it right? And, and this is one, one, this could be one leading factor. Um, and I, I definitely know that this, this happens when you get too caught up at work and you get too caught up in, you know, stress and in politics of situations and so on, it can, it can become all encompassing. And then it becomes very difficult to focus in prayers and just the worry encompasses someone, right? And it might start showing up in your dreams and you might just not have proper sleep. Like so many things can happen through stress because of worldly things, right? And so that's the, the, above, that's the level that we wanna, um, uh, we wanna make sure that we try to uh, avoid getting to that point. So then how do we attain this state and this knowledge, right? So um, we have to actively see this place as insignificant. This is, this is probably the, the, the most important thing. We have to actively see the world as insignificant. It's not significant in the sight of Allah. Someone asked a question the other day um, that the dunya or, or why is it that someone who might sin a lot or not pray a lot or disbelieve in Allah is so wealthy? Like, why would they be so rich? And why is it that someone who does do a lot of good deeds, why would they be um, not wealthy? And it's a good question. Um, the understanding in many contexts and other religions is that you do good and you will be prosperous and successful in this life. And prosperity and success mean worldly prosperity. And if you do bad, you will be damned and punished in this life from a point of wealth. That's not the understanding of our religion, right? The understanding of our religion is that the people closest to Allah, they don't even want this place. If it was offered to them, they say, I don't care. If they had all of the riches, billions of dollars offered to them, they say, I really don't. I, it's insignificant to them. He says, do it to the point. Re remove the love of money to your, from your heart until money becomes the same as pebbles and sand in your eyes. And we're going to get to a section where he says, none of this is required. These are all high stations. But this is what we talk about, the, the comparison of Jesus, the prophet Jesus, peace be upon him. But it was like, it was, it was, he, there's various statements where he mentioned this, that um, you won't reach a station of nearness until uh, money is the same as sand and dirt, right? And so we want to, we want to um, keep, we'll get to it in just a second. Now. We want to keep that um, in mind. That the Prophet ﷺ told us that, that this world is not worth so much as a gnat's wing to God. It's not even worth this. What is a gnat? Like a little, 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 um, I mean, it's a microscopic, you could say, bug. Not even worth the wing of a gnat to Allah. Doesn't matter. He gives it and he takes it, but he doesn't give it because he loves somebody. Or he doesn't take it away because he loves somebody. And he doesn't give it because he hates somebody. And he doesn't take it away because he hates somebody. But the people of nearness, they don't even want it. And then he said, the Prophet ﷺ said, that um, accursed is everything that the dunya contains except that which is for Allah. That you will be, um, it, it, it essentially he's basically saying that it is cursed and it is, it's filled with um, problems except that which is for Allah, right? And... What this does, when this knowledge comes in, so this is literally step one. Step one is this knowledge has to sink in. And we have to actively see it as like, this is not what I want, right? And this is difficult to do. The Sahaba would make comparisons to um, bodily excrement and so on when talking about the dunya and carcasses and dead bodies. That's, what they, that's how they would talk about the dunya. They'd be like, oh, you want this? That's what it's worth to me. You can have it. It, it, just, it wasn't significant enough for them to pursue actively it might allah might have given it to them but it, they they the idea is if it's given you hold it in your hand not in your heart hold it in your hand not in your heart right um so that's step one is sit with the knowledge reflect on these hadith and think about how much this place is actually worth when it comes to the grand context of it 
right? And it, one other way to do that is to reflect on the day someone is going to pass away and the moments that we are going to be buried and re put to rest in our graves and what will actually come with us in that. Just reflect on it. Come up with a list of here are all the things that I'm going to take with me to the grave. And then think, okay, of these things that I'm going to take with me, how many of the things that I worry about in the day-to-day -day are on that list? Well, I mean, you can't take your bank, no, no matter what, the bank account can't come. I mean, it's, it's, you can put like a, a, a slip of the, of the statement, the bank statement in there, and but that's about it. And the worms will eat that eventually, right? What's going to come with us? Yeah, actively think about it, right? How many of the things that we constantly worry about, the promotions and the, the politics at, and corporations and all these other things, how many of these things will come with us uh, that, that stress us and occupy our minds? And when we, when we reflect on that, we realize, oh, it's not really any of it because the only thing that's going to come with us in our graves, physically, people will be in a coffin, white sheets, two white sheets, and then um, uh, spiritually, their deeds, the good, their good deeds and bad deeds, the deeds will be with them. It's about it. As family, even family doesn't make it. They'll, they'll, one or two people would bury us, then they'll, they'll leave too, even if they stay for five hours at the graveyard, crying and making dua and so on, they'll eventually leave. Who's going to be with us at that point? Only Allah. And Allah with our deeds. Allah will give the believer their deeds. So when we make trade-offs then between things we could be doing to get closer to Allah and things we could be doing to get closer to the dunya, that's when this knowledge has to sink in, right? And be like, hold on a second. I'm trying to at least do a portion every day that's for my afterlife. Additional work. Five prayers, that's, that is, that's already the basics. We've got to be doing that. We're talking about additional, extra Quran reciting more, doing extra dhikr, doing, being kind to people, giving extra charity, all of these things, these build up, these build up, and these become deeds that then they go with us in our graves. And then when difficulty is about to descend in the grave, and we ask that this never happens to any of us, but if it does, the deeds protect us. They come out and they protect us. They say, no, 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 the Quran comes out and says, hold on a second. Someone, is, you're about to get punished and says, no, 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 this guy or girl, she recited Quran. I'm the Quran that they recited, it's protected. Surah Mulk is a perfect example. It literally comes and protects in the grave. Surah Mulk after Isha every day takes three and a half minutes to recite. Very few ayahs total, a page and a half. And it will protect somebody in the grave. It will protect someone in the grave. Right? These are examples of things that we want to be doing. So, um, yes, question. Yeah, okay, I was just going to mention, just for fairness sake, uh, also when you're a good Muslim, it makes you more prosperous in business uh, for the reasons why is because you're more patient. It, 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 uh, <clears throat> it builds up a lot of qualities that help you naturally be successful in business. Definitely. And even when sometimes when they say like follow God and you will follow you. So a lot of times like if you care about people genuinely, you can do better business. You're not hurting people, but you're patient, you're honest. If you're being a good Muslim, you're honest. And these qualities engender trust, and for some, and, and then you work hard. You have a lot of qualities that just make you prosper. Yeah, yeah. But if you use it for your family and people it a lot, it's a good thing. Yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. The 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 practicing Islam in the best way will attract all sorts of blessing to somebody. Blessing in their wealth, blessing in their time, blessing in their family blessing with, with any situations that they might be going through, all sorts of blessing. And there's a lot of ways within our religion that someone can increase their sustenance, increase their rizq, right? There's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, the idea, though, is that the uh, intentions that we have deep down inside are not clouded by love of this place. We're like, yeah, if, if Allah blesses us with more, alhamdulillah, we can ask for more too, alhamdulillah. But that never gets in the way of our worship to Allah. That it's not that the only time we worship God is when we want a promotion or when we want a new job. But all the other moments we're not there doing the extra worship. There's a problem there, right? That there's a means that when the love of the dunya comes in, now we know Allah is the, ultimately the one who controls the dunya. And so now we seek, right? That it's, it's, so it has to be done in a, in a measured way. And the, de the desire has to be uprooted. But yeah, no, very, very good point um, that, that, that that's made. So. Um, the, the origin, that's the first point, right? We have to realize that um, 
we, the knowledge has to be present deep down inside that this place is not worth, uh, this place is not worth, um, this place is not worth loving. And if someone's asking about questions, we just, we will do the online questions uh, in the live at, right when we get a chance for a break. We're gonna just, I, I gotta get a lot to get through. Yeah, I got a lot to get through. And so we'll do it right after, we'll do it after inshallah. Um, so what that then is a sign that somebody, would, it would be distracted. That when the love of dunya gets in the way of worship, what are ways that the love of dunya will get in the way of worship? He says, don't let the pursuit of the dunya distract someone from God's worship. If we are at work and we're so caught up with work that we forget to pray, it's a problem. If we're so caught up with what people will think of us, this is less likely in the days of remote work with what some what people will think of us during the days of COVID, uh, or sorry, what people think of us at work um, that we don't go to Jummah. We're like, oh, I can't take time off because Jummah. Right? Jummah for men is required, women it's, it's not required to go. Um, right? But we, we just, we, we forget to worship God because we're caught up in dunya, right? And a more deeper example of it is we are offered a job with the source of the income is haram, but we take it because we're like, I got it. Like it has more money in it, right? We could make less money doing a job we know is permissible. We can make more money doing a job we know is, is haram. And we take the haram, right? Um, that's very common in the community these days. We have Muslims that unfortunately owning liquor stores and selling liquor as their primary source of income. Right? And just, yeah, there's a lot of money in liquor, but the money's not halal, it's not permissible. Right? None of the traditional ulama ever permitted us to sell liquor or to sell drugs as our source of money. Right? But for sure, is it, can it be lucrative? California cannabis economy is booming these days. If someone wants to start a nice cannabis business, they could become a millionaire really, really quickly. But is that permissible in our religion? No, not permissible. Right? Rare exceptions of certain medical things and whatnot, but without getting into that. So we have to be mindful then of our source of income. Right. Another way we might get caught up is we might have to face a difficult decision. We might have to decide, hey, I could get um, a car that is affordable and it's not the coolest car, or I could get the Benz or the Tesla or the Beamer, and, and I got to take a loan for the car. Again, taking a loan in our religion with interest, if it has interest in it, it's haram. It's stern haram. Allah, Allah mentioned in the Quran that and again, if we're in this situation, we don't lose hope. We just have to learn the knowledge. We have to rectify the situation we might be in. It's not, the idea is to not, um, it's not to lose hope and to give up. But that he mentions in the Quran that he, Allah wages war. Allah and his messenger will wage war on the one who takes interest. There's no other sin that Allah explicitly mentions that he'll wage war on. Not adultery, not drinking alcohol. Right? None of the other major sins will, will, will receive the war from God. It's very serious. But we just, we might take it lightly. Why do we take it? Because the dunya, the love of the dunya has overpowered us more than the love akhirah. That if we were deeply concerned about the akhirah, we'd say, hold on a second. I got to examine this. I got to examine, is this permissible? Can I do this? Right? Um, I mean, I remember the, recently was having a discussion on uh, on loans and you know all different types of loans, student loans being in, 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 in that discussion as well. And it's a tough choice. Someone says, hold on a sec, I wanna go and I gotta take out 200K of debt. And is that permissible to take out? According to the majority of the scholars, it's not permissible, right? It's, it's an interest bearing loan. Is there any other way for us to make money? 99% of chances there are. But if somebody says, hold on a second, I have to absolutely do this and we, for, for, we forget the um, fact that something's impermissible, that would be love of the dunya coming over love of Allah. And so it's in these types of trade-offs, very difficult decisions. When it comes to economic decisions, and it's some of them, they're some of the most difficult decisions that a Muslim has to make because the society we live in has normalized these things, right? Credit is not haram, but it has to be 0%. That's all we're, we're, we're saying. Um, but if we happen to be in this situation, okay, we make repentance. We we start to pay off our car loan or our, home, our student loan or any other loans that we have that of interest as quickly as possible. And we repent to Allah and say, Ya Allah, I didn't know or I wasn't able to implement it. Please forgive me. And then we, we move on from that. We don't have to let it drag us down. But we don't actively do it moving forward, right? That would be um, important uh, to keep in mind. And so the... Um, uh, oh, what is dunya? Dunya is um, dunya is the the world, like the the ephemeral pleasures of the world. Yeah, that's what dunya means. So 
we defined world earlier as uh, not, or the world would be all of the things that distract you from God. Everything that distracts you from God that's in this life is considered dunya. That's essentially what, what it would be, um, right? So then we go on the next, the, the next few steps. So again, it starts with the light entering the heart. Then it goes into the knowledge that somebody has, that the knowledge that someone um, uh, inculcates inside that this place is not worth loving. It's not worth it. It's seen as, as um, insignificant in God's eyes. And then what do we do? We start to remove the different categories of love that could be possible. Category number one, we've been talking about this, wealth, money, right? Money and wealth, are that's one big category that we actively have to pray to Allah to remove. It's very difficult. This, is, this one is not easy because the human being is naturally inclined to desire this. It's a desire. That many of our desires, we are naturally inclined to have them. Obviously, if someone didn't desire to have some money, they could never make they could never make ends meet. They could never live, right? They could never have food and so on and so forth. The desire itself is not haram. The excessive investment or the excessive uh, obsession with the desire is what um, becomes a problem. And again, it's still not haram. None of these things would be outright haram until they lead us to haram. So the extreme end is when this love of the world leads us to haram. As we just mentioned, some examples of it. Someone, we, we take out, we do a job that is uh, that source of the money is haram. We get caught up in interest when that's impermissible and many of these other things. Then we get into things that just distract us from worshiping Allah, right? And um, love, love of money could be one example. Then he says, after that, you wanna, we want to remove the love of prominence and fame. The love of prominence and fame. What is the love of prominence and fame? The love of these days can be defined best as the love of followers, right? It's super easy to, to get these days as well. Um, the verses before, you have to like physically... People would like physically be following people around. Now they just digitally click, like follow, 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 and they follow people, right? But the love of that, the desire to get more of that, I want more and more likes. And if I post this and I get more likes and not and they analyze and let me figure out how exactly can I optimize the way to get the most amount of followers, that is far from our tradition. That is far from our tradition to the point where sometimes if it prevents us from speaking truth, speaking truth because we know that the people who we would be speaking the truth too, may not like us anymore or follow us anymore. Ooh, big problem there. Big problem there, especially if it relates to um, something that, uh, you know, be, be in, in, in um, uh, when it comes to, you know, the concept of religion. So we remove the love of prominence and fame. What this does is this now makes somebody give prominence to the one who deserves prominence. You and I don't deserve prominence. Like, if we think we're something, how are we going to magnify the one who deserves to be magnified? We're too busy magnifying ourselves. Oh, look at me. I have all my accomplishments. Look at this. And we're just like in this virtual digital mirror of narcissism where we just love ourselves, right? That is actually a form of shirk. It's a form of, 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 of a very, very deep hidden shirk called the shirk of the nafs, where someone takes the nafs and their ego as a god and they begin worshiping themselves. Do I look, make sure I look right way? Every little detail, they just... They're, and it, it's fine to look nice, but I'm talking about like it's an obsessive, um, it's an obsessiveness with with how how we we look, with how people perceive us, and we begin to worship ourselves, right? And that is very very dangerous. So after love of wealth comes love of prominence and love of fame, and we want to remove the love of prominence, fame, and yeah, someone mentioned the love of status, position, attention. We should never want position or status, right? And so that gets into the next one love of power and leadership. That there's nothing wrong if Allah gives someone leadership, okay? Allah wants them to do a certain position or so on. But to go out actively and to desire it and to want to control it and to never give it up even if the entire, you know, half the nation votes to remove you from office and still to try to stage a fake coup and, and all these types of things. I mean, look at the types of things that happen these days, that how much people will go to, to, to what extent people will go uh, to stay on with to power. I mean, people around the world, there's, there's literally military coups that happen where people have no problem killing thousands of people just so what they could stay in power. So they could live in the palace for like two and a half more years till the next guy who's going to have a coup will kick them out and probably kill them. I mean, it's very crazy, right? And it's, and it's because of, it's many times coded and I want to help my country and I want to help and, uh, and, it's rooted in love of fame and love of power, right? You'll see the sincere people, the sincere ones who actually want to do it. Um, 
they have a very different way of behaving than, than the corrupt ones. When, when the minute the corrupt ones get in power, they just take as much as they can. They don't give much, right? And the people who are sincere, when Allah gives them power, and it's a tribulation to have power because every single decision we make will be held to account by Allah. It's not, a, not, not something we should want. But the people who Allah gives the test of power to, they give more than they take. You'll see them, they don't, they're not trying to soak up the, 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 fancy, the fancy private jets and the fancy rides and the nice cars and take the money from the state treasury and so on. No, they're just, they want to give back and they're constantly trying to do work of good. And that's one of those tests of sincerity. So those are the, the, three, um, the three levels. And all of this is rooted in just being a person whose desires have taken over. Desires have taken over. And so we just, one of the reasons why we fast in the month of Ramadan is it's to tame our desires. It's all of our desires, not just the desire for food. The reason why desire for food, why food and sexual relations are limited in Ramadan is because those are the two chief desires, the, the mother-father desires. From them stem everything else, right? But if, so if someone ideally is able to tame their food intake and their sexual appetite, they should be able to tame all these other things. But it's difficult. And so that's why we have to actively work on it. We have to actively work on it, right? And we do that. And then what we, one of the practical ways to start doing this is we start to reduce the amount we take from this dunya. We take less and less and less. So what does he say? Limit yourself to the needs that you have. Now, back in the day, this was applied very differently than how it's applied now. The Prophet and the Sahaba, we're talking literal needs. Just the needs. It's very few amounts of clothing. Very few amount. They would eat very limited amounts of food every day. Um, they would have very very, very limited um, uh, structures in their homes, like, like much smaller size homes, and so on and so forth. And it was not that they couldn't have more. The Prophet ﷺ could have had all of the riches and palaces and luxuries of this world if he wanted. It would be no problem. He was presented the option. He didn't, he chose not to have it. He could have been a king prophet like Sulaiman right? who's still, of course, one of the most virtuous prophets. But the Prophet ﷺ told us for our ummah, I'm setting this example. And he gave this example where it's preferred to take less, but if someone is given bounty, then they are grateful and they use the bounty and the obedience of Allah. And we talked about that last week, that gratitude is when we use the, the blessings we've been given in God's obedience. Gratitude, um, we, can't be, we, we can't be grateful for a blessing if we're using it to disobey, to disobey Allah. So we start to reduce the amount. Now, how do we reduce? There's five categories to reduce, or two or three categories to reduce. First, clothing. Okay, I mean, this is... This is not that difficult to do. We, if we have 80 pairs of clothes, we just reduce it to 75 and give five of them away and to, to, to goodwill or to charity, right? I guarantee you those five we would have worn one time in that whole year, maybe, right? And then if we have, and then we slowly reduce. If we have 25 pairs of shoes. Many of us might have it. And we might be obsessed with these shoe marketplaces and constantly buying the latest new shoe and paying a lot of money for it, right? Okay, we just reduce the amount of shoes. Slowly reduce them. How many shoes do we really need? Probably like a pair of sandals, a pair of, you know, uh, running shoes or athletic shoes, one pair of, you know, dress shoes, whatever, a few pairs, right? Maybe women a little bit more because of the types of um, clothes and so on, right? But that's about it. Someone could really just get by with one pair, but if someone wants to have a little bit more, okay, alhamdulillah. But we can't just be like constantly buying shoes and this, this, that. Same thing with luxury, right? So you get to clothing, then you start with, then you go move on to, to, to other items. Items we don't need. People who are trying to renounce the world, they have very little portion of being obsessed with designer things. If we're like really into um, all the designer brands, uh, you know, Louis Vuitton and Her Hermes and all these different, I might be saying the names wrong, but all the different, these different uh, brands that cost insane amounts of money. And we're just, we love the status symbol that it brings that, you know, a $5,000 bag that provides the utility of, of a $50 bag, but we just want it because people can see, look at me, I got this. There's a problem there. It's a deep love of the world is embedded in us, right? It's one thing to practically want something. And it's another thing to um, uh, want, want something practically. And it's another thing to, uh, what's it called? To, to, to just want it for a status symbol, right? So we, we expand, we expanded that cars. How many cars do someone really need, right? And, and most, most people, you know, don't have like five, 10 cars, but same thing, right? We limit to what we need. And if we want something nice, nothing wrong with some, having something nice. But 
it can't distract us from, from the worship of God. How does a car begin to distract us from the worship of God? Well, if it has a super nice premium surround sound system that we just got to bump, the late music might be filled with impermissible lyrics, and we just got to do it because we got the nice car, and then we start to test the horsepower and the speeding and start to speed in the car and put others around us at risk um, because of you know driving in the wrong way. And these are just examples, right, of ways that it might own. And we take out an interest loan to get the car, so on and so forth. Um, same thing with, with obsession over just luxurious items. That if somebody is obsessed over um, with luxury, that becomes a problem, right? Being obsessed with luxury can become a uh, problem. So those are, those are um, uh, and, and he gets into examples of, of food and housing and so on and so forth. Example of food, right? There's some really, really, really exquisite, fancy restaurants. Someone could pay a few hundred dollars for one meal right? And regularly get attached to, to, luckily Muslims don't drink, it's usually the wine and the alcohol that costs the most amount of money. But um, we become just really into going to these fancy restaurants. That, that, that's a sign is there's some, some deep love of the world. We just, okay, nothing wrong with having some good food, right? We might not get to the point where we just want to eat like the most basic food, but we can't get to the point where we're going excess in spending and we're walking around and there's people who don't have any food to eat and we just drop a few hundred dollars on a meal for two people, right? That would be a sign that we got to work on this level of the world, right? Once in a while, if someone's company or something takes them out, that's different. But we're talking when someone actively goes and they, they fall in love with doing these types of things where it can become a uh, problem. But we have to know that the, the Prophet وسلم, and the Sahaba, they shunned it. They, didn't, they, they actively didn't seek it. Might have been given it, but they actively didn't seek the dunya. And it was something that they would actively avoid. And that's okay too. If someone wants to live that life, that's what he's referring to here. I'm not like emphasizing it as much because I know in our time, it can be very difficult to live that. But somebody can live that type of life where they're just like, I just have my needs. and I'm good. You know, I don't need to always, I don't need to have a bigger house every two years. I don't need to have this big, I don't need to always be up to date with the latest everything, Right. That would be considered very praiseworthy. And know that someone who does that gets a lot of reward. And they begin, when that happens, these ephemeral desires start to leave. Now the heart's open. When the heart's open, the deeper things can start to enter the heart. When the heart's open, so now the love of Allah, the love of knowledge, these things begin to take root. If you ever meet somebody who really loves knowledge, that's where they spend their money, just books. They, they, they'll, they'll spend a lot of money on books and books and books and bookshelves probably as well as carry all the books. Right. And then they just read, read, read and learn, learn. Like that, that, but it's, you, you try to ask them like, Hey, did you see the latest Tesla? And they'll just be like, what? And they just won't even care. Right. It's just like, I got a car, right. And whatever car they have, but it's like, they'll be so engrossed in what they do desire, which is knowledge of Allah. It's like a very different station. That's why it's so important for us to just spend like a week with people like this or a few days that they're out there. I remember one time I was in the same place that Imam al-Haddad was, um, was born uh, uh, in Tarim. And I uh, was just talking to one of the scholars. And they were just like so in this thirsty stage of loving knowledge. that They had just, they just like had pulled an all-nighter reading their books. And then they were still like super awake and like excited and, and still had all this energy. And they were teaching. And then they had like maybe there had been one or two nights that they had done this. And... I was just like, wow, I'm like, I slept and I had some tea and I'm tired still. And you didn't even, like, you're, you're just so in, in excited because of this deep, deep, deep love you have for what you're doing and this deep love you clearly have for Allah and this deep love that you have for knowledge that all the other reasons that, you know, most of us might pull all-nighters, that's not what, why, why someone was doing it, right? And they actually got more energy from that. It's a very different, it's like a different archetype of a person. It's not, it's not, it's achievable. It's for sure achievable, but we just have to keep in mind that we want to take baby steps towards it. And the first step we take is the, now we'll just wrap this up, inshallah. The first step we take is to um, implement a uh, knowledge of why this world is not a place worth pursuing excessively. Number two, what we do, is we begin to work on the love of money and the love of wealth. Then we begin to work on the love of fame and the love of followers. Then we begin to work on the love of leadership and power, right? 
in the love of desiring position and, um, and, and so on. And then from there, we begin to cut back specifically in these areas. It starts at the heart level, then it goes into the um, action level. We cut back in what we purchase, okay? And we just reduce the amount. Whatever thing we have that we love buying, we just buy less of it. And we reduce, we reduce the amount of clothing, shoes, and so on that we have in our homes, right? And the, the amount of luxuries that we tend to get obsessed with, right? And then from there, um, we get into this, to this stage where we'll begin to taste the sweetness. And when someone begins to taste the sweetness, alhamdulillah, now they will desire, they will shift the desire that they had that were channeling in one direction to another direction. And that direction, inshallah, will be the desire of loving Allah and of pursuing, um, pursuing Allah and pursuing uh, the, the knowledge of Allah. Then he finally ends and gives us a little bit of, of, um, of a way out of this, right? He says, look, if you're not able to do this, he says, if you're incapable of renouncing the world and you admit your desire for it, you're not to blame. It's all good. So if we can't do it, he's like, look, human nature, it's all good. However, he said, just know that the only time you'll have sin is if you enjoy the world in a manner that's forbidden by Allah. So if we're not at the point where we want to do this, at minimum, we have to be grateful for all the blessings that we have, right? But we have to be very careful to not let the love of this dunya get to a point where we begin to sin because of it. That's at the point where now loving the world will, have, will start to ruin us. And we already mentioned the examples of the sins, right? Of the type of sins that someone can do. There's one thing if it distracts us from better uses of our time. It's another thing he says that if we can't reach it, but we begin to get into a state of um, we get we get, begin to get into a state of sin because the last thing we want to do is on the day of judgment we have lived life for 50 years 60 years and we spent 40 of those years 20 of those years 30 of those years pursuing things that Allah would just be displeased by and by spending our life in a way that was bringing haram and losing the blessing in other parts of our life the effect can be felt here one of the things that and we'll end with this the effect of haram wealth and a lack of barakah in someone's wealth and time is felt in the next life for sure. And we pray that Allah forgives us before that feeling happens in the next life. But it's also felt in this life. More constriction comes. There's more stress. There's more fighting in the household. There's more tension. There's more problems. There's more family issues. All of these things stem many times from impermissible wealth, from haram wealth. And there's... The source, sins usually create problems in our life, right? Um, that, that can happen. This can be one example. It doesn't mean all of, our sin, all of our problems are because of this one specific thing. But we have to remember that even pursuing the world and loving the world and overdoing it can ruin someone's dunya, like life here as well as their akhira, right? And start staying away from it and starting to reduce it can guarantee someone the akhirah, inshallah, and can really, really help them in the akhirah and can also assist them in this life. And so we pray that we try to follow the example of the Prophet ﷺ in, uh, in, in, in the way that he showed us how to reduce our love for this world and how to slowly renounce this world and how to not be obsessed with the luxuries and the pleasures and the wealth and the money and the fame and the followers and the power. We, that we pray that Allah removes the love of that from our heart. That's the final thing we meant. If we really, really want to do this, just pray a lot to God to remove it. All of these stations that we've been talking about, only Allah can really give them to us. It takes work, but at the end of the day, God gives you the desire to even want to work on it. And then if he wants to give you the station, he'll give you the station. He'll give someone that maqam of reaching this. And when you meet that person, the, the, when, you, when, you, when you and I meet those type of people, we'll, want, we'll be attracted to them because we'll know that there's some depth here. There's a lot of depth here. And they'll, they'll that... Um, there's something more than just what we see, the, the ephemeral pleasures that we see. So with that, we'll do a few questions, and then inshallah, we'll go ahead and end for Salat al-Maghrib. Um, if there's any questions online. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Any questions here first or online? Yeah. Um, can you explain uh, the topic of uh, the Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. The question was, can we explain uh, the evil eye, like Nazar, and how does that pertain to not trying to show off or um, like kind of overly mention or even really to mention too many blessings? Um, yeah, so the Prophet told us that the Ayn is haq, it's real, it's a reality. 
um, the way it general uh, and Allah knows best. These are things of the unseen, but the way I've understood it is that it, when we are discussing our blessings with someone, someone has an internal jealousy about that blessing, and intentionally or unintentionally, they may give us what's called nazar, nazar, right? And there's actually bad nazar, which is evil eye. If you meet really, really righteous people, they'll give you good nazar. And that's like a whole separate topic. It's not evil eye. It's kind of like a way to lift your spiritual station. Just by looking at you, they'll help increase you. But um, the nazar you're referring to, the evil eye, it will now start to create, manifest as an envious jealousy and um, problems will start to manifest in someone's life, right? Regardless of whether that was the intention of someone or not. So it's an it's a, it's a unseen concept that results in the rem could result in the removal of that blessing. It could result in sickness. It could result in problems. It could result in issues with someone's marriage. All these types of things are within that realm. Um, so this, the, our religion has told us, the Prophet ﷺ told us, the scholars have told us, that be very, very, very cautious of who you share your blessings with, right? Because you have no idea who's a well-wisher and who isn't. Um, and so you, and, and Nazar is very real. In the world of social media, it's very real very real. And so it's also recommended like a few practical steps to stay away from it. One, limit what someone posts. Someone gets in a new job, someone's blessed with a child, someone's blessed with getting married to very much limit. Like all those things that other people want, right, but they don't have, to be very careful how much someone discusses that and mentions it, especially publicly on social media, um, but even amongst people who you're unsure of, right? Um, but that would be one, 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 one way to do it. Secondly, then someone actively should be doing du'as, and we talked about them earlier in the book, again, on protection against these types of things, against dark forces and nazar, um, and evil eye. So there's a lot of du'as and odad and dhikr that we can do. The three is three times in the morning and evening at minimum, and then there's a, a bunch of others that we should be doing regularly that will protect us from this, that even if we try to take the precautions, the nazar can be so strong that it might still get to us, that these dickers that we do will give us uh, kind of a force field and fortress um, for it. Absolute third, there's like a whole another category of, of jinn and of sihr and of black magic being done on someone intentionally or of a jinn getting to somebody. That's all real. It's all mentioned in the Quran. But um, so they can be linked to Nazar sometimes as well uh, in terms of creating problems in, in someone's life. Yeah. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Okay, other questions? Questions? Okay. Okay, let me see if there's anything online. All right. Okay, alhamdulillah. All right, so we'll go ahead and end with that. Um, inshallah, so for, for um, next week, I will keep everybody informed via the WhatsApp group on if there's class or not. Most likely we'll have it. Um, it's just a small chance that we don't. And then we have two more chapters. We have one chapter left on uh, reliance on Allah, tawakkul, and trust in Allah. And then the final chapter, which should be a beautiful one, on divine love and contentment. Um, and that's the ultimate station you want to reach is where, where someone is in a state of love with Allah. They're in love with Allah. Allah loves them. And Allah is pleased with them, and they're pleased with Allah. And then we'll be in the conclusion, and then we'll finish that out. Um, inshallah, so we should just have about two or so more, more classes left for this, for this text, inshallah, um, at which point we'll take a break and uh, for, for a month or two, and then we'll start a new, new text, inshallah. So we'll go ahead and end with the dua. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil Alameen. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim. Rabbana dhalamna anfusana wa inlam taqfilana wa tarhamna wa nakunana min al-qasirin. Rabbi dhkhilni madkhala sidqin wa khrijni mukhraja sidqin wa ja'alni minna dhalka sultanan asira ala ilaha ilaha anta subhanak inni kuntu min al Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, Ya Karim, Ya Allah, we ask that you remove the love of dunya and the love of power and the love of fame and the love of followers and the love of anything it is that is displeasing to you from our heart. And we ask that you attract us to you and we ask that you bring us closer to you and we ask that you allow us to prioritize worship of you, Ya Rabbil Alameen, in all of the ways, inwardly and outwardly. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Subhanakallah wa bihamdika. Nashadu wa lai.